thought you were going to say, I changed your life. <laughs> I changed my life. Please. A lot of applause. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's so, so, so amazing to be here at Quadic. I can't even tell you the like sheer joy. And you'll understand why as I talk a little bit more. Um, I want to introduce myself a bit to you. I want to start by telling you that I really like awarding points. I'm super into this house game idea, and so we'll have a few opportunities to win points for our groups, houses. Who here, who here is at their very first Wadek? Oh my gosh, give all these people an applause. Yeah. Okay. Now, of those people, who understood what the game is enough to explain it to other people? Anyone? Who is first Quadic is? Yeah. Oh, wait, we need this microphone. I might be wrong. Just to get this all done. Uh, so there's different houses that correspond to the houses in the Harry Potter books. And every time a person asks a question during a talk, after at the end of a talk, that house that they are a part of gets a point. Okay. If it's a good question. Oh, is that, oh, the, is is it, that the rule? I if so it's I a good question. I didn't know that part. <laughs> I, I actually didn't know that, the, that you got a point for asking a question. So that's awesome. Oh, okay. Good. I think it's for anything anything good, right? Oh, okay. Does, does any, uh, so uh, the, so, okay, so who here has been to, uh, so raise your hand if you've been to Aquatic before. Okay, uh, I'm gonna count down, keep your hands up. And um, how many Aquatics have there, have there been? Okay, wait, okay, so keep your hands up. Put your hands down if you've only been to one Aquatic before. Wait, 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 yes. <laughs> All right, this is complicated. I want to, okay, so basically, if you've only been, so if this is your second Guadic, put your hand down. If this is your third Guadic, put your hand down. If this is your fourth Guadic, put your hand down. If this is your fifth Guadic, put your hand down. If this is your sixth, wait, somebody's hand went up. This is, <laughs> if this is your sixth Guadic, put your hand down. Seven. Eight. Nine, okay, for the people who have their hands up, wait, first of all, applause for people who stick around. <laughs> okay. okay. So somebody who's been to five or more aquatics, tell me, what does giggle mean? <laughs> okay, a newcomer can give us, if, a newcomer who can tell us about giggle, which is very exciting. It's a genetically engineered goat, large. <laughs> <laughs> to like, okay, so wait, and I forgot to reward the points. Ah. Okay, so you were from house? Orange. Orange is, yeah. orange is, That's right. is Wanda. That's right. Okay, so who can tell me, who can tell me who Wanda is? Uh, uh, who yelled out fish over here? What's your what's your house? Wanda. You don't get a point. <laughs> you shout it out. You have to raise your hand, <laughs> and then I'll call it. <laughs> Emanuele. Wanda the fish. Wanda the fish. Okay. And you are house. I am. Orange. <laughs> okay. Orange. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, who can tell me what Wilbur is? I didn't know what this, I didn't know Wilbur. Uh, Wilbur is the gimp mascot. Which is? I've uh, always wondered Wilbur. this. It's Wilbur. All right, Wilbur. good enough. And you are house? The Wilbur piece. What, you are house? Oh, uh, Wanda. Wanda. Yeah. All right. And, and who is Rupert? Raise your hands oh, up in the back. Yeah. No. Better go. <laughs> yeah. Rupert is, Rupert is a monkey. Yeah. All right. Okay. He's also a really bad Irish sheep. Okay. 
Now that we got that out of the way, one more piece of housekeeping, which is that the tour tonight has been unfortunately canceled due to unforeseen circumstances, but the Sunday tour is going to happen. Okay, so I really like awarding points, as you'll see, and we'll do more of them, so don't worry. Um, I am a lawyer, and I do pro bono legal work for GNOME and other free software projects. Nate is looking afraid that I said I'm a lawyer, but... Oh. Um, I can move my computer. Better? Hi. Okay. Um, and, uh, and of course, I am, I am a lawyer, but this is not legal advice, and, advice, and I am not your lawyer. Um, I'm, of course, a GNOME user, and uh, I co-organize Outreachy, um, and I'm the executive director of Conservancy. Who has heard of the Software Freedom Conservancy? So that's like three quarters of you. Oh, a t-shirt. Wait, which house are you in? I have no idea. What color is on the corner of your... What is it? Purple? Purple is Rupert, everybody. Okay. Um, so Conservancy uh, uh, is, a, well, is a charity where we are the umbrella organization for about 40 free software projects. We work on some of the most ethical issues in free and open source software, some of the most important issues. Um, and uh, did, can anybody name, and raise your hands, a Conservancy member project? Get house. Green. Yeah. Inkscape and house. Yeah. Green. green? I'm in. I'm in green too. So. So that was turquoise. That was turquoise. Wilbur. There we go. One more. Neil. Outreachy. Out yeah. Okay. And wait. House. Green. Okay. I gotta hurry up with my talk because this is gonna take too long. <laughs> okay, ah, these are all of our, our all of our member projects. Uh, we have about forty. It's uh, it's definitely software. If you're here, you're using some of our software, um, and uh, we're constantly growing. And we even have um, some member projects like Coreboot, who I haven't put on my slide yet. <laughs> um, I am perhaps most well known because I literally have a big heart. I, um, I have a heart condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where um, my heart is, I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. And uh, uh, in order to combat that, I have a pacemaker defibrillator, and I can't see the source code in my own body, which is just, I can't even explain to you this. Uh, raise your hand if you are also a cyborg and comfortable saying that you're a cyborg. Huh. Okay, houses, because we cyborgs need to stick together. <laughs> Bluish. Bluish? Wait, so you are Wilbur, and you are green. green. Hey. Two thirds of the cyborgs here are in Gaggle. Wow. Be afraid. But it's not all bad being a cyborg, because I'm unique, and uh, I'm able to uh, help people understand better the ethical issues around our software. And I, in the whole process of coming to know that I had this medical condition and that I needed my pacemaker defibrillator, um, I, I, I thought that open source was cool before I went through this process. But going through that process made me realize that software freedom is essential. And it made me realize that, um, that I, I needed to be able to understand the software in my own body and that that software was a metaphor for all of the other software we rely on, which is connected to um, our lives in so many ways. And I thought that I had finally found the way to explain software freedom to non-technical people. I thought I had finally found the way to explain why software freedom was so important to people who only maybe cared about things, what we would previously have said, sort of open source or the, the commercial side of free and open source software. And I was smug. This is me at GNOME Summit, uh, the North American Summit in Montreal, the Software Fair Linux office in 2013. And I, I'm like happily chatting away in an interview about how um, we're all moving towards software freedom and this is such a big issue and we are on the cusp of really understanding why these issues matter and why we are gonna fight so hard and why we're gonna write this important software. And I thought I really knew how the world worked. 
I thought that I really understood what was going on, and the media that I consumed, everything I watched and everything I was around kind of confirmed that around me. And then I thought, well, you know, even if I'm not right about one or one thing, maybe two things, you know, <laughs> I generally know how the world works. Well, you know, um, turns out not so much. Um, and it turns out that, um, that a lot of things changed quite recently in our uh, global political climate. And it's caused a lot of people in our community to rethink their priorities and to rethink where software freedom sits within, or where free and open source so software fits within their priorities um, of, of what they do. And at the same time, it's become harder and harder to limit ourselves to free and open source software, um, even if you are a so-called purist. Um, if anybody tells you that they are only using free and open source software for everything, uh, they are probably confused or not fully representing the situation. I mean, I, I think, or, or, or you get somebody else to do things for you that require proprietary software, right? Like, I, I, I do things as pure as I, as I, as I, I avoid, uh, my mother's here actually, she can tell you how annoying it is. Um, I, do <laughs> I do things um, with using as much free and open source software as possible, limiting my proprietary software to my, um, to my defibrillator. But in fact, it's impossible to book a flight or interface with a bank or do anything, um, you know, any, live in the practical world without using some proprietary software. And so the important thing in my book is to, to draw the line thoughtfully and to make sure that we make the right choices <coughs> for us and that we push towards the direction of, of, of what's right. But I got a little off track because of, um, uh, because of the, the, um, uh, the, the comment. But, um, but I think that, um, that, that for, for most people, I think that we get to this point in the political climate where they, are sort of, you know, I think a lot of people are drifting and wondering whether this movement that has been going on for so long is still as relevant, whether or not there are more important issues, and whether or not there's a real context for software freedom in the grand global political climate. Okay, sticker time, or point time. What logos are these? Raise your hands. In the middle? Signal. Signal, and, oh wait, you, what? Yes, and your houses? Um, Rupert. Rupert. Stockholm. And what was the other one? Stockholm. Oh, it's GNU PG. Oh, you're wrong. Who corrected? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Gaggle. Uh, All right, good point. <laughs> what? It's the bluish. Oh, okay. Turquoise. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna run out of time. Okay, so the good thing, <laughs> so the good thing about the, the political climate that we're living in is that some people have finally woken up to the situation that many of us have been aware of for a long time, which is that privacy is really important, and we need to be cognizant of you know of, of surveillance going on around us. Um, and so many people have started to do things that are really positive, like encrypting their communications, and it's galvanized a lot of people to be political and to start taking. Um, taking action and asking big questions about um, what they do and how it fits into the world generally and whether they can make any influence in fixing things. But unfortunately, what I found after the election was a lot of our donors started to email me saying, I'm giving to the ACLU. The ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union in the US, is a very worthy charity. I love them and they're awesome and I, they need to exist. Um, but what's interesting is that, um, and it's not just conservancy, um, I checked with quite a number of other small free software charities, and, um, and, and many of, and there are quite a lot of free software charities, um, and, and almost all of them have seen the same results. A, a, a basically, a deduction not just in, um, in donations, but also in volunteer time, as people became demoralized and felt like this was, you know, regardless, sort of, uh, you know, feeling like maybe software freedom wasn't as important, and I think that happened along political lines. I'm not, you know, I, I think free software is not unified by a common political outlook necessarily. I think people have their own political views, and um, and there are people who I know here here at this conference that are um, are present from a very wide political spectrum. And I think um, that software freedom has a lot of commonality. That's great, but I think there's been there's a lot of demotivation around software freedom. And and at first I thought, have I got this wrong? Like maybe you know, maybe but being into, into free and open source software means always being open to the possibility that I might not be right. 
and someone might improve on what I'm thinking and what, I'm, what I know and, um, and give me an new information. And so I, I, I first thought, maybe, maybe I'm really wasting my time. You know, I'm working these crazy hours for a free software charity. And is, does that even make sense? Like, wh why am I even doing this? And I, I sort of re started to rethink everything from first principles. And, uh, and, and what I, I, I found was actually a, um, a basic convalescence around the idea that we have to protect our technology, and especially the integrity of our core technology. So we are, we are living in interesting times. Things, um, things have been moving and changing rapidly, and, um, and we are fast developing the technology that, um, that could create the dystopia that we have all read about in all of our scientific or all of our science fiction novels growing up. Um, this is a smart TV, which is so literally Big Brother. Does does anybody here have a smart TV? Never mind. I don't want to run out. You. But. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, the smart TVs are voice activated. They're con constantly surveilling your home, <laughs> waiting for you to use the wake words. There, there are lots of devices that are like this now in the uh, so-called Internet of Things. And I overheard somebody say that the, uh, the S in Internet of Things is for security. Um, again. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we, we're, we're bringing all of these devices into our lives and networking them with our other systems in such ways that we are, are, are basically baking in surveillance into our everyday lives. Now, I think probably many of us here in this room have avoided these technologies, but they are, um, they are being developed and they are, they're starting to become very difficult to avoid. For example, when I got my, I just, I just recently got a new defibrillator. I can show you my beautiful new. Um, so I, mean, I recently got a new defibrillator, and I thought, this is going to be so much better than the last time, because the last time was a decade ago, and things have improved. This is going to be great. And when I went to get my new defibrillator, what I was told is that there were no devices that didn't broadcast wirelessly <coughs> all the time. Um, I, my device was an old device. It was old at the time, and I got it because it had no uh, radio telemetry, um, because it was an old device. And I felt safe and secure with that device. With my new device, it was broadcasting wirelessly with no encryption, no password protection. Um, so uh, I managed to find, after calling all of the device manufacturers in the United States with my very understanding doctor's office help, um, I found, and, and one device manufacturer who told me that their devices were hack proof, so I didn't need to worry about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I found, I found one company that says that I could have, that could disable, has a radio telemetry, but you could disable it via using software, and then you can use um, a magnetic uh, coupling, basically, to reactivate it if you want to uh, down the road. And so I went with that one device. Of course, it's a European manufacturer with a very small presence in the United States. Um, so uh, uh, this, and, and the idea that it's acceptable for me to have a medical device that is broadcasting without any real security consistently around the clock is terrifying. And, um, and many people have these black boxes that sit by their bedsides that are basically um, you know, collecting information all the time. And recently, there was shown to be a vulnerability in those devices that could cause a mass attack where you could kill people. And uh, you know, this is not theoretical. This is, and, and, and as we progress, it gets worse and worse. And as we move towards new technology, like self-driving cars, right? We're not only talking about the, the surveillance component of somebody who can track where you go all, at every move, every time you leave the house if you use a self-driving car, and setting up, um, and setting up, they're also setting up all the infrastructure around it. So, uh, and then on top of that, having the, uh, the ethical questions of what to do in the, the instance that the self-driving car hits, you know, is, is going to get into an accident. Does it prioritize the life of the driver or the life of the pedestrian, or does it calculate the number of lives? These are questions that have to be decided, and they're all ethical questions, and they're all happening with companies that are using proprietary software that cannot be reviewed and cannot be controlled um, you know, by end user consumers. And it's, uh, it's, we are really entering a very critical time. And so I, uh, I, I, talking about cars, 
of course, reminded me of Volkswagen. And um, does everybody, who here doesn't know what happened with Volkswagen quite recently and their emissions scandal? So, um, so the basically, uh, as Toby's pointing out, companies can, so basically, there was a famous scandal because they were found to be uh, basically co covering up what the actual emissions were and, um, and trying to fool the, the test so that it looked like their cars were doing better than they were. Um, and we know that there were engineers within Volkswagen that were trying, you know, that knew that this was happening and tried to either, either couldn't, um, you know, either tried and failed or felt like they couldn't even raise the issue to begin with. Engineers that were in the company, there was at least a corporate culture such that they were not able to do the right thing. And, uh, and so, you know, this, this made me think about, you know, the equivalent for free and open source software. Um, you know, it's not that necessarily even that, because we have companies, I just got totally sidetracked. Sorry about that, everybody. The, uh, so within free and open source software, we have companies that are very involved in our free and open source software projects and often take leadership roles. And, um, and, and it makes you wonder what their corporate culture is, right? Um, because sometimes companies, even though, um, they, even though they may be very well intended, they may not have our best interests at heart. So for example, somewhat recently, I was pregnant and I got shocked by my defibrillator. Um, because my heart was doing what normal pregnant women's hearts do. Now, only 4% of all pacemaker defibrillator patients are under 65. Fewer than half of pacemaker defibrillator patients are women. So the set of women that are, have pacemaker defibrillators and who are pregnant is super small, right? So when my pacemaker defibrillator shocked me, the answer was not to find out whether there was a, you know, whether we could adjust the algorithms within and the monitoring within my defibrillator, I was put on drugs to slow my heart rate down so that, so that my defibrillator wouldn't unnecessarily shock me. Right? So totally, but it stands for the perfect proposition because Medtronic has absolutely no interest in having pregnant women shocked, right? Like it is like the last thing they want for their pregnant patients to get unwanted shocks. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but nonetheless, because we are not a big focus group for them, because we're not the standard consumer, we are not kept in mind when the device is designed. And because being pregnant is a temporary condition, right, I was able to stop taking that extra medicine when I had the baby, and I'm no longer pregnant, right? Um, when, when, because of that, they, it was a very low priority, but it was a very high priority to me while I was pregnant. Right? And it's very hard to predict what your situation will be that's different from the focus group of, you know, for what the company is targeting when it develops its product. And this is true across all of our products. We, you know, and, and also, uh, you know, our geographic area, you may have noticed, for example, that um, Google Maps doesn't work as well the further you get from San Francisco. <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> I actually don't really know. Somebody said that to me yesterday. So. <laughs> um, but but the, the main point is that we don't want to have single companies um, responsible for our technology. It's like the cat mining the fish store, right? So to get further back into my background, I went to the Cooper Union. Does anyone know what the Cooper Union is? In the back, hand raised. What, what is Cooper Union? It's a free academic institution in the US. What's your house? I haven't awarded points in a while. What's your house? Green. Green, gaggle, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going with green. <laughs> um, so, uh, so Cooper Union is a free institution, academic institution, which in the United States is remarkable. And actually, it's not quite free anymore, but that's a long story. It was when I went there, and it, uh, it was founded on the idea that education should be um, as free as the water and the air from an ideological perspective, that, um, that uh, people should have the opportunity to get educated. It's entirely merit-based. Um, and at the Cooper Union, um, I, uh, I learned a lot about engineering failures one of our first, our first engineering course was a course where we had to read all about the 
um, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge and all the famous engineering disasters. I'm here seeing a lot of nodding of heads. A lot of famous engineering disasters um, over, over the years. And, um, and the idea is that um, when, um, because engineers have special knowledge, they have a responsibility to the rest of society. And, um, and this was introduced to us. Does anyone here, is anyone here an, a member of the Order of the Engineer? I knew Allison was when I, what house are you in? <laughs> Rupert, okay. So Rupert. Okay, so the Order of the Engineer started as a Canadian institution, and we were one of the few um, engineering schools in the United States that had it. Um, the, the Order of the Engineer, and it, uh, is, uh, is you get sworn in to uphold the ethics of being an engineer. Um, and the original uh, uh, oath was written by uh, Rudyard Kipling, which is uh, pretty interesting. And I have this picture because you know that someone's in the order of the engineer because they wear um, a metal ring, it's a plain metal ring on the little finger of their dominant hand so that they are reminded of these obligations and responsibilities while they're working. And so this is the oath that I swore <coughs> to get into the order of the engineer where I said that I would pledge to practice integrity and fair dealing, tolerance and respect, and that my skill carries with it the obligation to serve humanity. Um, I, I found that, uh, that, that this, I didn't think too much about this at the time. In the United States, there's, there aren't a lot of people doing the order of engineer, but in Canada, it's much more prevalent. Um, so all, like whole entire engineering classes do it, um, and engineering schools. Um, and it, but it stuck with me. And as I started to think more about the situations that we were in, I realized that my attitude about technology and about software was really informed by what I had learned about engineering failures and the order of the engineer. Now, the order of the engineer is also kind of fun because, um, <laughs> <laughs> because, because before, um, before uh, you get sworn into the order of the engineer, um, it's like your last night that you can do, like the night before you get sworn in, it's your last night to do pranks. Um, before you're, you're ethically obligated to not do them. Um, so, uh, so this says uh, Occupy Mortar uh, One Ring shouldn't rule them all. Now, uh, now I, I, you may have noticed that my talk title, The Battle Over Our Technology, is dramatic, right? It sounds really epic. But you know what? We are in an epic battle right now. We are establishing massive infrastructure I mean, the infrastructure that's going to need to go in place, to be put in place for self-driving cars, which is very well underway, the, the, you know, all of the infrastructure, the way we communicate with each other, and everything is still, we've, we've gone down a lot of roads already um, in, on many of these areas of technology, but in a lot of ways, things are still shifting, and there's a lot of opportunity to steer things in a better direction. Because we have to go to battle. You are here, aquatic. You are like the order of the engineer. You have special knowledge. You are technologists. You know what's happening, right? And you know that we need transparency, accountability, neutrality with our technology, and we have to take the ability to, to control it. That matters where the control of our technology is. This is really important stuff, and the only people who can fight this battle is us. The only people who understand why software freedom matters are people who are at conferences like Guadec. So pat yourselves on the back for being here, also because it's pretty much the awesomest conference ever. Um, so great. Um, but also because you've gone through a process where you've, under you've come to understand what software freedom is and why it matters. And that's really important. Software freedom democratizes technology. So as we look at the political climate, no matter what your political background is, as you look at where things are right now, we are in a tumultuous time. And software freedom helps with a balance of power, which is extremely important and will continue to be important. GNOME is special because GNOME has stuck to principle. Alan gave an amazing talk this morning um, the GNOME way. Um, and if you haven't, if you weren't there, I highly recommend going to see it. And Alan, I don't know where you are. Alan, is he, are you in here? I don't see you. Not in here. Mm. He's, 
I was going to give him a point, but no point. Uh, <laughs> he's gonna, I'm glad because uh, he would really hate the design on this slide. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but he summarized our principles as that we are principled, that we believe in freedom, that we make inclusive software, that we do high quality engineering, we care about the stack and we take responsibility for the user's experience. And Allison suggested we add civility and respectful discourse. And, uh, and he talked about GNOME's charter, which says from the early days some of the things that we you know, the, the principles that we were going to stick to, and we have stuck to them, and this is the link to the, the charter. Um, and I, I recommend that, um, that people, some of it's outdated, but the principles hold true. They are amazing and impressive. And, um, and GNOME is 20 years old. This is a, a, a screenshot of the 15-year birthday web page we put up. With all these, um, raise your hand if your birthday is during Guadalc. <laughs> it always <laughs> Federico, you get another point for your house. Which house was it again? Was it was it Wilbur? Rupert. Rupert. Yeah. All right. Who won that? <laughs> um, and uh, and the fact that GNOME has been around for so long is a direct result of its principles. The reason why it has continued to be successful, not necessarily always on a straight uphill trajectory, as was pointed out in a previous, in Alan's session, it's not always a straight uphill because it's hard to stick to your principles. It is hard to do it. It is hard to keep the balance with corporations, right? It is hard to keep steady and to stay a community, but GNOME has done it. Right, and it means that it will con it, it continues to have these cycles of of ever gaining success, um, in my view, um, and 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 stays relevant because it sticks to its principles because it has governance. Who knows who these people are? Uh, raise your hand if you haven't answered any questions yet. Alexander. Yeah, what house are you? Wilbur, Wilbur is the turquoise house. Okay, um, so this is our, your, your board. Raise your hand if you're on the board. If you are on the board, if these people want to be talked to and bothered, they're, they're volunteering, <laughs> they've, they've like stepped up to it. So if, you, if, if, if you're a newcomer, make it your one task of your thing to do aquatic to talk to at least one board member. Um, and, then, um, and then on the side is, uh, is Neil McGovern, who's the new executive director of GNOME. And I can tell you that because GNOME is so awesome, there were tons of applicants for this position. And the, it was so tough. Raise your hand if you were on the hiring committee. Yes. These people, and I was on the hiring committee, all volunteered to help, with the help the board hire the new executive director. And it was so hard because there were so many awesome people who wanted the job. And Neil is the one that we all decided was the best. I can't believe that Neil is executive director of GNOME. He's so awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, is that together we all get all of this. We all get why GNOME is important. We get why software freedom is important. We understand these issues, but other people don't. How many people here have tried to explain software freedom to someone and failed? Like, Practically almost everyone here. Raise your hand if you have explained software freedom to someone and successfully gotten them to take some action towards software freedom. That's amazing, like a quarter of people. But we all know how hard it is to explain what software freedom is, let alone why it's important, right? Like, it's so hard. It's hard to explain to people that there is software underlying everything, that it is so important that our technology and our software now are becoming inseparable, right? That at where our technology is, our society is starting to be inseparable from our software. And so making sure that we have a safe underpinning of our technology and our software is becoming essential to a safe society. And I think that we have become a little bit complacent, I have to say. Like, I think I even became a little bit complacent, as an, and, and I was in an activist role. Because I sort of felt like, well, if I stick with software freedom conferences, they're really fun. <laughs> you know, uh, people write more free software. But it is time for all of us to get out there and, and, and take more action, because it's really important. This is the order of the engineer ring. And, um, and I feel like by coming to Guadec, it is like you deserve a, a, a special ring 
where to remind you that you are special and you have special information about the world and can help everybody. Take the ideals behind free and open source software, namely that no one and nothing is perfect. <laughs> um, take that to, to, to the other world because we can't, we can't just be reactive. Software freedom is a long-term issue, right? We're not gonna win tomorrow. The, the world is, we're not gonna have all free and open source software within the next few days, like the next few years. It's a long-term issue. But our technology is becoming so essential to what we're doing that we, we, can't, we can't focus all of our energy elsewhere and, um, and, and hope that it goes the right way. So I implore you and ask you to think about the ethical implications of what you're doing. Often there's a business case to be made for doing the right thing. Free and open source software got its start um, basically with an industry on those lines, selling software freedom as, uh, you know, for all of its incidental benefits. And there's often a really good reason why software should be free and open within a corporate setting. Raise your hand if you uh, make money, if it's your primary role to work on free and open source software. It's like three quarters of the room. Um, get involved with business discussions if possible. Ask questions. It never hurts to be friendly and sort of say, hey, have you thought about, you know, have you thought about possibly releasing more of the code? It never hurts to have the ethical conversations with people. It especially never hurts to go into your law the, the lawyer's offices at your companies that are involved with licensing choices and say hi and tell them that you're interested in free and open source software um, and that if they ever want to talk about anything, you're available. Um, and speak up about things early and often. Now, I know it's hard, but the more of us that do it, the less, like, the less unusual it will be. Choose copyleft. One of the reasons why GNOME has survived for so long is in part because of its license choice. Um, copy left, raise your hand if you don't know what copy left is. So we've got two people. Raise your hand if you can explain what copy left is in less than one sentence. In one sentence. <laughs> Self-replicating freedom. Self freedom. Good one. What house? House? Uh, I think one last one. What? Orange is Wanda. <laughs> Wanda's gonna catch up, I can feel it. Um, negotiate your employment agreements, right? Like, how many people here have signed employment agreements? Like, also, like, three quarters of the, of the room. Um, these can be negotiated. Software Freedom Conservancy is working on an initiative called Contract Patch, where we're providing information for developers to better understand their agreements and negotiate them, because if every developer that a company tries to recruit says, hey, does your, you know, does your, does the software I'm gonna work on, is that gonna be free and open, you know? <coughs> like, if you just ask the question, if you ask um, to put provisions in your, um, in your employment agreements about keeping your own copyrights or about any other ethical things, even if just asking for the provision in a friendly way after the offer has been made to you is very low risk. And if the companies get the message that this is something that talented developers are interested in, one company will start to move. And if one company starts to move, more companies will start to move. As a lawyer, I taught a class called the Continuing Legal Education class, which is a class for lawyers to basically recertify their, um, uh, their uh, ability to practice law. And in that session, I asked those lawyers how many of them had written a contract where developers had kept their own copyrights and three quarters of the room raised their hand. I was amazed because those lawyers work on, many of them were outside counsel, worked for more than one company, some of them were in-house. Um, so some of these things are possible, we just have to organize. We have to stay coordinated. We have to go to things like WADEC and support GNOME, support the GNOME Foundation, become a GNOME Foundation member and vote. It's very important. Because when it comes down to it, for me, it all comes back to my heart, right? I, I can't, every day I think about my heart condition. Every day I live with um, my defibrillator and, um, and I, it renews my interest and devotion to the ethics within our technology. But you know what? 600,000 more people get defibrillators every year. Like, or I guess pacemaker defibrillators. Um, but we are all in the process of becoming an unbecoming cyborg. We are all in the process of relying on our technology for our most essential things. And so software freedom is the 
underpinning to have any possible uh, safe and productive society together. And of course, this presentation is licensed freely. <laughs> Does, I think I have, I, there's, I didn't know who was timekeeping. I don't think anyone is. Um, but I think I have about four, question, four minutes for questions. And you are house? Rupert. Rupert. When you raise your hand, know what your house is. <laughs> there was no copyright information on the image of Seven of Nine? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. So my, my question, because I need, I need it to be a question, what's the copyright on that image? <laughs> so that, that's a very good question. That image was promotional material from the network when they, uh, when they promoted uh, when they promoted Voyager initially, or during that season, and uh, and so I consider it to be fair use. So uh, that is actually. <laughs> I no, I agonized over whether to include it because I, I and there are a couple of other images that are the case, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and you'll you'll find that uh, that when there's reference material about the Seven of Nine character and sometimes about um, Voyager generally, they use that particular image because it was widely distributed by the um, by the production company. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Um, how, how I have uh, a general curiosity about the pacemaker technology. Um, my grandfather died last year because his pacemaker uh, gave out. And so what is the balance between um, sort of having an understanding of like what's going on tech technologically with your pacemaker and how reliable it is versus um, having it be protected. And is there a way with sort of the using open source technology for the user to both keep that informa their information private but also have transparency about what an understanding about what, what's going on with the technology inside them? Yeah, I'm really sorry about your grandfather. Um, this is a really, this is a definitely a tough area. Um, what I want, what we have right now is the worst of both worlds. Right now we have proprietary software and no real security, right? We have no encryption, no passwords. So we have closed source software or proprietary software that you can't review and also no actual security. I want the other way. I want real security but transparency with the technology itself. So I want access to my source code but I don't want other people to have access to my defibrillator, right? And I should be able to get that with decent security. Now, everything is vulnerable, as we know, so I'm not looking necessarily for, I mean, I'd love a, a hack-proof defibrillator, but I'm not holding my breath for it. But right now, what we have is, is untenable. And so I have friends that are medical device security researchers who are more interested in, um, in open data um, and more interested in, in getting more information because right now patients don't have access to their own data either. And being able to review your own data helps you be able to tailor your own uh, medical care for yourself. So this is a very large area with a lot of intertwining issues. But if we don't have software freedom, we won't be able to, um, to audit our source code going forward. And security studies all show that free and open source software is safer and better over time. Because software is free and open doesn't mean it's safer or better, as we all painfully know in this room. But, uh, but it stands a chance over time. When there is a problem, it's what you can do about it when the problem happens. Because if you have proprietary software, you have to wait for the company to first admit there's a problem and then do something about that problem. Free and open source software, we can all get together and write a patch and, and improve things. And if I wanted to get together all of the pregnant patients to donate money, to help, uh, you know, to improve the, the algorithm so that we wouldn't get unnecessarily shocked, I could do that. But right now I'm reliant on Medtronic, which has the best of intentions with respect to pregnant patients, but. Oh, what was your, um, your house? Okay. Your house is, oh, you see, we're getting multiple. What's your house again? My house is uh, the bluish one. Because you're a cyborg too. Yeah, I'm a cyborg, and I have a defibrillator for two years. And I think with the open data or getting in, getting access to the data, it's not only for the pa patient a problem, but also for the doctors. 
for example, on my when I had an episode where uh, my heart stops stopped and the defibrillator stopped the recording and it didn't g uh, gave the um, the heartbeat when the heart stopped. So it w was grayed out in uh, in the diagram or in the graph. So even the doctors c couldn't see what happened with my heart and how it be um, misbeated. I don't know how to say. And yeah, it would be great to, to get open data or at least doctors can read the data. The same point, we need control of our data. We need to yeah. understand how, this is not just about medical devices, right? We need control of what, without free open source software, we can't review what data is being collected about us, right? Yeah. So these two issues go hand in hand. Being, having the right control over our data, data and also review and auditability and accountability and control of our software, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. Exactly. We've run out of time, okay. And Sam, you get a, a point because your house gets a point because you're awesome at organizing. Excellent. What's your house? All right. <laughs> Thanks everybody. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be here for all of Wadix, so feel free to ask questions. Thank you.